Aircraft's National Research Council found that below standard air quality on commercial planes is what often causes passengers to feel sick or dizzy. The report was commissioned by Congress after the Association of Flight Attendants made several complaints. Eileen Abt of the National Academies of Science headed the study and says air quality is a serious issue that's received little attention since the mid-80s. According to Abt, some of the air quality problems stem from pesticides, which several countries require to be sprayed on aircraft. Other issues include low oxygen levels in the cabin, poor environmental control systems, elevated ozone concentrations and significant increases in the number of aeroplane passengers. The study calls on the Federal Aviation Administration to ensure compliance with air quality regulations and carefully study flight attendant symptoms to determine long-term health effects. Gesundheit. When it comes to allergies and asthma, pollen in the summer months and inner city pollution are often blamed. But in reality, the air in your home can be just as harmful. Which is why more and more people are demanding so-called healthy homes. Building consultant Bill McCauley believes that underwrapping like this cuts airborne pollutants by 50%. It lets air out, but stops too much coming in. Allergists agree that managing the air in your home can reduce the chance of developing asthma. Condensation around windows or pipes breeds mold spores, which can cause sneezing and wheezing. The best way to stop mold is to replace wood or copper fittings. Medical assistance should be sought for asthma and allergies, but doctors are also advising that often health care can quite literally start in the home. Autumn for many is a joyous time of year. The crisp cool weather and the holiday season is energizing and festive. But for those suffering from seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, mood and energy drops with the leaves, resulting in a lack of concentration, weight gain and depression. In fact, most people suffering from SAD have trouble getting up in the morning, while facing the day can seem like a gloomy prospect. Neil Owens is a SAD sufferer and one of the first research subjects in the 80s to undergo light therapy for treatment of the condition. Owens created the first light boxes that were used by major medical institutions conducting SAD research and later went on to build them for consumers as well. The special full spectrum artificial light helps reset the biological or circadian rhythms while boosting levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain. Exercise and a balanced diet can help the darkest days of winter seem a little brighter. At first glance, the statistics don't seem so ominous. An estimated 163,000 people are infected with HIV or AIDS in Russia, a country of 147 million people. But experts fear the real figure could be five times higher. In anticipation of World AIDS Day, UN AIDS and the World Health Organization released the grim statistics, showing the former Soviet bloc now faces the fastest growing infection rate. The increased use of intravenous drugs is of key concern, as is the epidemic in the pediatric population. This hospital in St. Petersburg is the only one for HIV-infected children, abandoned by their mothers, mostly HIV-infected drug addicts. More than 80% of the reported cases are in people under 30. AIDS is now the fourth biggest killer around the world. Africa continues to be the hardest hit, with almost three quarters of the almost 40 million sufferers worldwide. Researchers in the US are reporting an alarming new increase in drug resistance among HIV positive people undergoing antiretroviral drug therapy. 50% of Americans undergoing highly active antiretroviral therapy are developing mutant strains of the deadly virus due to irregular use of the drugs. 
Researchers measuring the blood viral levels of 2,000 people undergoing the therapy also found that 64% of participants experienced a rise in viral levels over time. This indicates that they're receiving less benefit from the drug cocktails than they were a few years ago. The main reason for these alarming figures is that drug compliance is so difficult. The study found that 20% of all newly infected people were already carrying drug-resistant strains of the virus. If the trend continues, the HIV virus could develop resistance to all drugs. The AIDS crisis has had another unexpected side effect too. It sparked a diverse cultural response from both HIV positive and HIV negative artists. Positive Lives is one of the most remarkable responses. For eight years, it's charted the course of the virus and its impact on people's lives. According to the exhibition curator, Kevin Ryan, this art has many different uses, for health, for education, and for knocking down barriers of stigma. Literature has also seen an explosion of HIV content. AIDS provides elements that are crucial for a good read. Love, sex, death, and plenty of drama. Like no other health crisis, HIV has sparked creativity that comforts, questions, and also explains. Art homespun as well as highly sophisticated continues to chart HIV AIDS progress and reflect it onto a wider audience. Val Garvey was told not to expect any miracles when her son Poirik was diagnosed with autism three years ago. Doctors told her he'd never be able to form relationships, use his imagination, hold conversations, or even dress himself. Now six, Poirik can do all that and more. Autism remains a mysterious condition that affects one in 500 people. It's a neurological disorder that varies widely. But what autistics all have in common is an inability to forge social relationships naturally. Porek's progress came from a unique home-based educational program pioneered by the parents of 28-year-old lecturer and writer Round Kaufman of the Sunrise Program at the Autism Treatment Center of America. At 18 months of age, Round was diagnosed with severe autism and an IQ of less than 30. By the time he was five, all traces of autism had disappeared. The Kaufmans realized that they had to get Round's attention, so his parents joined him in his fun activities. The Garveys are now following the principles established by the Kaufmans 25 years ago. Through playing, Poirik is learning to unlock his imagination, to communicate his desires, and above all, to build confidence. The Sunrise program doesn't offer a cure, but it provides the means for an autistic person to show the way in and for their parents to show the way out. For these youngsters in Beijing, studying is a constant uphill struggle. All of them are mentally handicapped to varying degrees. The Beijing Fortune School for Mentally Retarded Children is attempting to give these 50 children a brighter future. According to a recent survey, around 1% of children under 14 are mentally handicapped. That means that over 3 million children are in need of specialized education, but very few ever go to school. Two women, Professor Huang Yiping and Professor Mao Yuyan, teamed up to open this school in 1985. Professor Huang's daughter, Wang Wei, is now 25 and works in the school kitchen. Her proud mother is determined to give other children something her own daughter never had, access to proper care and education. The Beijing Fortune School has grown over the years. It now has a staff of 20, including six full-time teachers, and provides education for children aged 3 to 14. The school is privately funded, 
and has developed its own teaching methods. There's much emphasis on recreational activities as well as the arts. It also provides in-house training for its teachers and support staff. Zhou Jingren has attended the school for the past three years. He was born perfectly healthy, but soon contracted meningitis, a serious inflammation of the brain's lining, which resulted in brain damage. His parents, both well-off business people, hired a maid to watch him 24 hours a day, as all the local schools refused to enroll him. The real breakthrough came when they discovered the Beijing Fortune School. According to his teachers, Jingren could not stand still and would destroy things when he first arrived. But they've seen a substantial improvement. And his mother has too. In stark contrast, life is bleak for 13-year-old Gonggi, who lives in a poor village in the mountains north of Beijing. He hopes to drive a tractor one day but he may not even be able to fulfill this simple dream. While the nearby town does have a school for mentally handicapped children, it costs more than the family's entire annual income. Gonggi now spends his days wandering around the countryside, and there's very little that can be done to brighten his future. When Anna Luzinski came to the United States from Austria for surgery over a year ago, it was cerebral palsy that made it difficult for the seven-year-old to walk. Surgeons operated for roughly eight hours to lengthen several muscles and rotate her femur to bring about an amazing transformation. This pitter-patter of little feet is music to her mother's ears. The Mayo Clinic Biomechanics and Motion Lab in Rochester, Minnesota has the same technology used by Hollywood animators and video game designers, only they used it to help children like Anna walk normally. Anna is first outfitted with the cutting edge equipment, which is monitored by cameras and balance plates all the way down to the heated floor. They measure the intricate and complicated actions that go into walking. From the location of several small markers, doctors can calculate how the joints are moving, which is then used to guide surgical treatment of patients. Surgeons who performed Anna's previous operation are amazed at the dramatic change in her gait. Today's session is more than just a celebration of her progress. Anna is back for more treatment. This computer-generated stick figure made in her likeness will help the surgical team plan her next procedure. It's the same type of software that perfected the legendary swing of Tiger Woods for a video golf game that's putting a swing in the step of youngsters like Anna. A major research study has revealed that nearly a third of heart attacks and strokes could be prevented with wider use of cholesterol-lowering drugs known as statins. The study, billed as the world's biggest trial, involved 10,000 people testing the new drugs. Statins are normally given to people who have very high cholesterol levels, but the study showed they also work in those with normal or low cholesterol. The British Heart Foundation described the findings as a major advance in the treatment of heart disease, especially as 1.5 million Britons currently suffer from the condition. Six years ago, Callie Perkins came to UCLA for a heart transplant after a virus damaged her own heart. Today, she and her husband Craig are making a social call. They've come to see cardiologist Dr. John Kobashigawa, the man who helped Kelly get her life back. 40-year-old Kelly wants to share one of her proudest achievements. She recently returned from Tanzania, where she became the world's first transplant recipient to climb Africa's highest mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro. Kelly's eight-day trek was recorded by a documentary film crew. She's climbed other mountains in the US and Japan, but at 19,340 feet, Mount Kilimanjaro was the highest and the most challenging. 
Being a transplant recipient means that Kelly fatigues quickly. And because nerves were severed during surgery, her heart doesn't keep pace with her level of exertion. The climbers set out for the summit at midnight in sub-zero temperatures. Having conquered Kilimanjaro, Kelly's now looking for another mountain to climb. It's her way of demonstrating that transplant recipients can live a full life while encouraging people to save lives by being organ donors. Kelly's plea comes as a timely reminder, following the news that Robert Tools, the recipient of the world's fully contained artificial heart, died. Tools received the Abio Core, a grapefruit-sized plastic and titanium heart. Only expecting to live 30 days, he survived for almost five months. The former teacher moved from Colorado to Kentucky five years ago to receive a heart transplant, but was turned down because of his deteriorating health. But ultimately, it was abdominal bleeding related to his severe and chronic medical condition that killed him, not a malfunction in the device. Six people, including Tools, have so far received the artificial heart. The Abio Core is designed to extend the lives of patients who would otherwise die of heart failure and are ineligible for a heart transplant. Its internal battery system allows patients to be free of tubes and wires required to power previous devices. And contrary to traditional medical belief, researchers have found evidence that human heart cells can regenerate. Doctors discovered that a recipient's own cells multiplied in the new heart, repairing damage previously considered irreversible. Just days after surgery, male transplant patients who received female hearts had new blood vessels and muscles with male chromosomes form in the female hearts. This means that the recipient's remaining heart tissue may have had primitive stem cells that were called into action to repair damage. Scientists are now trying to harness the self-healing power of cardiac stem cells. Someday they could treat millions of heart conditions just by stimulating the body's own regenerative power. U.S. researchers say they've created an air filter system that's capable of destroying the deadly anthrax bacteria and a host of other lethal viruses, including smallpox. The air purifier that can kill airborne biological agents in ventilation systems was developed at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland. Dr. Richard Potamba created the device out of an inexpensive commercial filter, then added the purifying system. The hybrid unit combines free radicals to help kill the viruses, with new technology known to neutralize airborne pathogens with ultraviolet light. To test the device, scientists piped in molecules that imitate viruses, bacteria and spores. After being run through the filter and cultured, the artificial contaminants were dramatically reduced to an almost undetectable level. In addition to killing anthrax spores, Dr. Potemba's device could help hospitals prevent the spread of infectious agents. The filter's patent pending and could also be available for commercial use in subways, hospitals and government buildings within a year or two. In other news, the United States Centers for Disease Control has warned that prescribing doxycycline to pregnant women who may have been exposed to anthrax could be harmful. Health officials worry that doxycycline could stunt fetal growth when taken during pregnancy, recommending instead the antibiotic Cipro, the first drug approved against inhalational anthrax. The latest health recommendations for pregnant women is the opposite of the recommendation issued by the CDC to the general public, who are now advised to use doxycycline over Cipro as the first drug of choice. The change came when health officials became concerned that Cipro was being overprescribed, which could lead to possible resistant strains of the bacteria. 
Doctors are now advised to prescribe doxycycline to non-expectant patients who may have been exposed to anthrax. Although no clinical tests have been conducted, the CDC believes that Cipro is unlikely to pose any substantial risk to expectant mothers.